Hmm. Well, now that we've gone through the book of Revelation, what are we going to do? That's a good question. Application. <laughs> Welcome to Roger Lewin Faith Teachings. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book, Revelation 22, 7. What does it mean to keep the word of the prophecy of this book? To keep this these words. Most people would agree that that sounds like obey, right? To obey or to walk in them. But it also means, and that's true, but it also means to keep, to hold on to, to make sure that they stay intact. We have a tendency in our church, in our society, uh, to, to think, well, that doesn't apply anymore, or, or that was old covenant, or, you know, whatever. It's important to understand what the Word says and not just repeat what other people said. It's dangerous when people cut things out and add things in. And we're going to get to that in the end of uh, Revelation today, because that's the last final warning. And so it's important to know what it actually says. It's really important. There's a lot of ways to interpret this book. I read so many interpretations, but it's dangerous to just put our own words in there or just repeat what other uh, people have said. There's a couple keys to understanding the book of Revelation. And one of them is to actually read it. <laughs> There's a blessing for reading and reading it out loud. It's all about Jesus. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what the name of the book is. And it reveals Jesus. And all these things that are happening in the book reveal parts of his character, his will, and his purposes that are coming on the earth. So number one is to realize this is about Jesus, and he is the living word of God. So that's why it ties into the whole rest of the Bible. There are hundreds, maybe even over a thousand references uh, from the rest of the Bible in the book of Revelation. So understanding the whole of Scripture really helps us understand Revelation. Second of all, to understand Revelation, we need to have inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If the Spirit doesn't make it alive, the Spirit doesn't make it jump off the page to you, then then it's it's not going to penetrate and cause the same effect as if it's alive with the, the Spirit of God. So, Heavenly Father, I do pray, Lord, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you'll make your words come alive to us, and you'll show us what you want us to do and how you want us to understand it, and so that we can walk this out and fulfill your purposes at this time. Thank you, Jesus. A revelations, a book of prophecy. <laughs> prophecy literally means to make something clear. And it can be just divinely empowered, forthtelling, speaking, declaring God's will and purposes. So if a preacher speaks the things that he's heard from the Lord, he is prophesying. Prophecy also, and this is probably the more common understanding, can predict future events. And of course, Revelation, we have both. The, the declaration of God's will, and these things are going to happen, and this is what you need to do to be ready. So, the Revelation uh, describes itself as a book of prophecy. Revelation 1-3, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear, that means to understand, and keep there is that word again, keep what's written in it for the time is near. Revelation 19.10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> Revelation 22.7, behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy in this book. And Revelation 22.10, and he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. The time is upon us. Revelation 22.18, the warning I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And the final warning and exhortation that this is prophecy, Revelation 22, 19, and if anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy in this book, God will take away his share in the tree of life in the holy city, which are described in this book. So it's pretty serious to put our own words and the other thoughts of others in here without actually digging in and see what does it actually say. And I do believe that there's a bigger, broader connotation uh, because I think that God is big enough to know that when he was inspiring John to write this and, and commissioning him to go read these to the churches, send these letters out to teach this, 
that he knew this was going to be the last book of the Bible. So when he said, keep the words of the prophecy of this book, I do believe there's a broader context that it applies to the entire word of Scripture. So we don't want to add, subtract, or fail to walk in this great way that he has shown us. He has shown us his way. He has shown you, oh man, what is good, what the Lord requires of you, to love mercy, to walk justly, to be humbly before your God. Let's be doers of the word. Blessed are those who keep the words of prophecy in this book. This blessing is for those who keep it, who guard it, who walk it out. It's not for those who talk about it and think about it and like what everybody else is saying about it, but those who actually apply these things to their lives. Oh man, keeping it and the blessing is going to come. Jesus said, if you love me, now listen to this, Jesus' words, keep my commandments, John 14, 15. And some versions say, you will keep my commandment because it's kind of like an imperative. You know, it says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Even as Christ loved his father and kept his commandments. So he was our example. That's John 15, 10. And those who keep the sayings or words of Christ in this book will stand firm, having built their house upon the rock. Matthew 7, 24 and 25, right? And and John 8, 51, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never see death. So there's tremendous reward in just simply reading asking the Holy Spirit, how does it apply to me? And then walking it out. Wow, that's like the life of God manifests on the earth when we are obedient. What does it say that we need to do in the rest of the scripture to be ready for the day of the Lord? Second Peter really wrote in depth about this in in chapter three. And I'm gonna read from the ISV International Standard Version. He said, recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the commandment of our Lord and Savior spoken through your apostles. First of all, you must understand this. In the last days, mockers will come following their own desires and they'll ridicule us by saying, what happened to the Messiah's promise of return? Ever since our ancestors died, everything continues as it did from the beginning of creation. Verse five, but they deliberately ignore the fact that long ago the heavens existed and the earth was formed by God's word out of water and with water by which the world at that time was deluged with water and destroyed. Now, by that same word, the present heavens and earth have been reserved for fire and are being kept for the day when ungodly people will be judged and destroyed. So don't forget this fact, dear friends. With the Lord, a single day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a single day. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some people understand slowness, but he's being patient with you. He does not want anyone to perish, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as like a thief On that day, the heavens will disappear with a roaring sound. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done on it will be exposed. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, think of the kind of holy and godly people that you ought to be as you look forward to and hasten the coming of the day of God, when the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved and the elements will melt with fire. But in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home. So then, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, make every effort to have the Lord find you, and here's our application, at peace, without spot or fault, Think of the Lord's patient as facilitating salvation. Now, that's one little phrase in the ISV. It's a pretty good version, but uh, facilitating salvation. Okay, contemporary English version said, the Lord is patient because he wants everyone to be saved. That's what that means. The Lord is waiting because he wants as many people to be saved as possible. And our job is to tell them about the goodness of God. Okay, back to 2 Peter 3, 17. And so, dear friends, since you already know these things, continuously be on your guard. Here's another one. Watch. 
Do not be carried away by the deception of lawless people, people who are not governed by the word of God, by the law of God. They're lawless. They do what they want to do. They can be in the church. They can be teaching the word. But at the end of the day, they do what they want to do. So we're, we're to watch out for them. It says, otherwise you may fall from your secure position. That is a, a stern warning. Instead, this is what we should do. Now, we, he told us what not to do. Now, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior, Jesus, the Messiah, Yeshua. Glory belongs to him both now and on that eternal day. Amen. Keep ourselves set apart for God. That's what's called holy. We don't sit on a cloud with a harp and act good. We put ourselves in a position where God can use us set ourselves apart for work. We avoid the distractions and confusing of this world and we look forward to his coming with anticipation. Peter just had this burning desire to let people know what's coming and, and how to walk it out. So that's why I think that the whole of scripture is something to be considered when we're looking at the end days. Revelation 22, 8. Now I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down and worshiped before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And then he said to me, see that you do not do that. <laughs> this angel bore the message of the kingdom of God. And I think John was so overwhelmed and in awe of this glory being revealed to him. He just fell down in, in, in worship. I don't think he was you know, trying to worship the angel, but the angel brought the message and John was just overwhelmed and awe. But the angel was quick to refuse the worship. You know, we don't want to have people uh, lifting us up and talking about how great we are. We want to point all that back to Christ. He is the only one deserving of this glory. And even these most powerful angels pouring out the wrath of God and standing before the throne, they are quick to point everything back to God. And here the angel speaks to him and he said in finishing Revelation 22, 9, I am your fellow servant. And of your brethren, the prophets. Isn't that interesting that he numbers himself among the prophets? Why? Because he declares the purposes of God. He is forth telling with divinely inspired word of God. So he said, I am your fellow servant, like a bond slave. He's serving out of love. The angels had a choice too. At one point they split and half of them became demons. <laughs> the other, well, third, and the rest of them are serving the Lord by choice. They're bond servants like we are who love and serve God. And he's numbering himself among the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book. Isn't that amazing? And then he tells him, worship God. <laughs> That's the bottom line. Okay, so then he said, do not seal up the words of this prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And that's really interesting to me because Daniel 12 verse 4, the angel tells Daniel to seal it up until the time of the end. And I think that really the book of Revelation is key to understanding the book of Daniel. So Daniel was sealed up till, till now, to till the end of time, and Revelation is open so that we can understand the things that happened previously, as I say, they tie in. These things are coming to pass. The fulfillment of these prophecies is right on the horizon. If you're watching and you're reading, you can see these things are coming down. I have a few really like fanatical football buddies, right? And they watch all the games. So if I ask one of them today, just call them up and say, now who's going to win the Super Bowl in two years? You know, he might make a wild guess and he might hit it right, but it would be a stroke of, of luck because we don't know what's going to happen in two years. A lot of things can happen. But as he follows the game, like I pick one of them in my mind, he's watching the teams. He's watching the coaches. He's watching the players. He's seeing how the teams interact with each other, strengths and weaknesses. He's starting to get an idea who's going to be in this final game. And as we're looking, as we're reading, as we're watching these things being played out, we're going to get an idea of when these things are going to happen and how they're going to happen. Yes, it's true that nobody knows the day or the hour, but the godly will not be caught unaware like a thief in the night. So, okay, let's look at Luke 21 and verse 34. And we're going to look at the symptoms of those who 
do get caught unaware. So he says, take heed to yourself. Watch out, warning. Your hearts don't be burdened down with dissipation. Burdened down with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of life that that day would come upon you as a snare. Now, burdened with dissipation and weighed down, it really means to be dulled. It means to be dulled by, look, Things like even overeating, uh, uh, things like uh, a, a buzz. I remember when I used to be in the world, somebody asked me if I had something to drink or smoke something or did something. No, I just have a little buzz. <laughs> that was nothing, you know. I can drive, I just have a buzz. I believe that we should show people that you can have joy and you can have a fulfilling life and you don't have to have those things. Now, if you live for those things and every day you have to wake up and get your little buzz and do this, this is what this is talking about. It'll dull your senses because while you're busy getting your buzz and feeling good and going about your day, uh, things are happening that you'll become unaware of. Uh, destruction could be right on the horizon. Sometimes Christian will look at this list and he'll say, well, well, I'm not dissipation and, and I'm not drunkenness. I'm not in drunkenness. But what about this next one? Cares of this life, the worries, the anxieties, the things that preoccupy our mind. This has the same effect. It overwhelms our emotions. We, we think about them and then we lose sight of what's coming and we can be unprepared. So that's one of the reasons why in Philippians 4 it says don't be anxious about anything. Roll those cares over unto God. Trust Him and let His peace guard our hearts and minds because it helps clear our emotions and our minds so we can see what God's doing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11 says, Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters. We don't really need to write you, for you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything's peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them suddenly as a pregnant woman, the labor pains come and begin, and there will be no escape. He said, but you, see, this is the, the key, but you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief, for you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us, not destined for wrath. Christ died for us so that whether we're dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are doing already. Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right, let's move back to Revelation 22, 11. Someone asks you, where in the Bible does it say, be unjust or be filthy? <laughs> you know where that is? Revelation 22, 11. He who is unjust, let him be unjust. <laughs> Still, he who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him do right. Be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Okay, this is kind of a funny verse, but he's saying something important here. It's inevitable. He knows it, that people are going to do as they choose, and he will not stop us from doing wrong. If we have his word, uh, we do have his word, and we know what's right, and we know there's rewards and redemption for those who follow Christ and go down the path of life. The consequences for taking the wrong path are ours to claim. He leaves it in our hands. We have that freedom. That's why I ask you at the beginning of this lesson, what are we going to do with what we learn about Revelation? The proof of the pudding is in the eating. We have to walk this out. So if we just study this book, and we learn everything that's in this book, and we don't change the way we think or act, then we miss the most important part of this book because Jesus wants to reveal himself, his character, his purposes to us and what's coming so that we will be ready and we get ready by doing something different. So why is there so much evil in the world? Why is there so much pain and death and suffering? It's because mankind is free. 
to choose the wrong path and to continue on it. But that time is coming to a close. God is getting ready to intervene. And another way to say what's in this verse is that if we're unjust just when he comes, we're going to continue to be unjust. And if we're filthy when he comes, we're going to continue to stay filthy. The condition that he finds us in upon his return is going to determine our eternal condition. Again, let's look at the verse, Revelation 22, 11. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Here, still means to continue in that condition. So this is written for us. And don't be satisfied with your right standing with God. Press in to know him more. Don't be uh content that you set yourself apart from God and everything's done. Press in to set yourself more apart. Be ready for his purposes. Grow in righteousness. Grow in holiness. When he comes, it's going to determine eternity for us. We may be saved. Yes, salvation comes by faith, but our rewards come through our action. Jesus said that at his appearing, uh, he's going to be like a thief in the night. And if people knew a thief was coming, they'd be ready. He's letting us know. So we'll be ready and not be caught unaware. So he's going to be, he's going to appear and he's going to bring rewards. And there's going to be vindication and joy for us who have continued in his word and separated ourselves for his purposes. But there's going to be torment. There's going to be a real shocker for those who have lived for themselves and not turned from their sin. So Revelation 22, 12 said, And behold, I am coming quickly. That means he'll be here suddenly when he comes. And he's going to give to everyone according to his work. We'll stand before the Lord and be accountable, not only for what we actually did, but for every thought, word, and intent of our heart. That's why it's so important for our lives to be hidden in Christ. You know, salvation is by grace, but the rewards are for what we actually do. But with the resources that God has given us to help build his kingdom, he blesses us so we can be a blessing to others to pass it on, right? So it is not wrong. Some people think it's wrong to seek rewards. It is not wrong to seek heavenly rewards. It is wrong to seek those rewards from men, to seek the attention, the affirmation, and the and the uh, worship of men. That is wrong. But we need to follow Christ and follow his example. Live as a human being filled with the word of God and empowered by the spirit of God. And keep the words of this prophecy, <laughs> Revelation twenty two thirteen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who wash their robes. The King James says, do his commandments. I don't think these are at odds. Wash his robes by doing, we are cleansed by being obedient to the word. Jesus said you're clean already in, in John 15 because of the words I spoke to you. Why? Because they were acting upon them. Okay. Uh, blessed are those who wash their robes, King James, do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. But outside are the dogs. Right, right. Who are the dogs? Look, Second Peter again, you know, has some warning. 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 22, 2, 20, 2 Peter 2, 22. A dog returns to his vomit. These are chronic backsliders who die in their sins. They are on the outside. You know, they can say they believe in God and they do utter, but they continue to live in their sin. Jesus died to deliver us, to save us from our sin, not so that we can just get delivered and then go back and get delivered and then go back and, you know, that in and out. Not only is that a terrible witness, and it is possible for those people to be saved, that's true, but if we continue to live in our sin, that is evidence that we are maybe not saved. So outside are, again, Revelation twenty two fifteen the the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexual, immoral, the murderers, and the idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. This is the third time in two chapters that he makes sure that we know that no liars are going to be in the kingdom of God. You know, in Revelation 21, 8, 21, 27, 22, 15, no liars will be in there. That's why it's so important to examine our heart and that we 
live truthfully. You know, God is not mocked. He knows every intent of our heart. When we tell a lie, he knows what we're going to do before, from the beginning, from the end. When we make a bargain with God, God, if you bail me out again or you do this, I'm going to do this or that. He already knows what we're going to do. Isn't that a, a kind of a sobering concept? To be honest and to choose to be honest, sometimes it takes a while to break some old habits, break the exaggerating or trying to be boastful or trying to impress people. But God will help you break that off your life. To be honest is very, very important. And God will help us to establish our words. Revelation twenty two sixteen. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. Uh, what he's saying here is that, you know, in the beginning of Revelation, Jesus sent his angel to tell John to tell the churches. <laughs> So John's mission was to tell the churches these messages and to proclaim this prophecy to the churches. He said, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So not only did he support in David and he was uh, what David grew out of the faith and the righteousness by faith and out of Jesus himself. Of course, all things come from him, but but David manifested the life of, of Jesus. He was the root and he's the offspring of David. So he's by his a physical descendant of David too, but he's also the bright and morning star, which points the way on a dark night to the dawn. You know, <laughs> in the Old Testament, Jesus was a son of righteousness with, with healing in his wings rising. You know, he was the bright brightness of the day that dawns redemption for Israel. For us, as this last period of time comes through, it's, there's going to be a darkness that comes over the earth. There's going to be a falling away, and we're going to have to press in. But guess what? The bright and morning star hailing the dawning of a new day is rising. Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah. Revelation twenty two seventeen. And the Spirit and the Bride say, come. <laughs> I love this. The Spirit and the Bride. The Spirit wasn't ready to say come until the bride got ready. And the bride wasn't ready to say come until the Spirit overwhelmed her and, and cleansed her and, and filled her with the purposes of God. The Spirit and the bride together say come and come quickly, Lord Jesus. Genesis 1, it's interesting that you know when the earth was dark and without purpose, the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. It prepared it for this new creation that was coming. The Spirit of God was brooding like a mother hen over its chicks. And then the Word of God came and boom, there was an explosion of life and creation. I love the way Reinhard Bonnke illustrated this one. He had this little contraption, you know, like in a laboratory, and he had hydrogen gas coming down into this one tube and coming up into another tube, and then he had oxygen coming down this tube and coming up into the same tube. So the hydrogen and oxygen were mixed in this center beaker, and it's clear. And then he took a little light, a match, and he stuck it in, and pow! Water! water created out of things that look like nothing. The Spirit is hovering over the bride. The Spirit is brooding over Christ's church and the people who are going to move into this next creation. And when the Word of God, the living Word, appears, makes its appearance, boom! We're going to walk into the new era, the new heaven, and the new earth. I think it's a picture of redemption. We see that same picture pattern in the first chapter, Genesis 1, and in the last chapter, Revelation 22. Revelation 22, 17. And let him who hears say, come. Let him who has ears to hear, let us cry out, come. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Whoever desires take of the water of life, behinam, the Hebrew word, freely. <laughs> this reminds me of Isaiah 55. And if any of you know Tom Irwin, I used to love this. He would quote this, ho! Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. So Isaiah 55, speaking of redemption. And there is a price to be paid for a redemption. But Jesus paid that price. Come to Christ. Live for Christ. This is this is the final call. And uh, But there is a serious warning right after this. In Revelation 22, 18, we get to this serious warning again. For I testify to everyone who hears Here's the words of this prophecy of this book, that if anyone adds to these things, that means to put upon or lay upon, to put over these words, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book.
serious, 19. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life, the book of life, and from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. This is so serious that I really want you to go away with this point. All the plagues in this book, uh, losing your right to the tree of life, to enter the city, the, the river of life, just for adding to this book, just for subtracting from this book. You know, say you had the, the, the danger of just imposing our own opinions or even repeating what other people say about this book when you haven't got in there and look. And, and in the broader contents of the whole scripture itself, we need to know what it says so we're confident in these last days because when we pray, we pray the word of God. And when we pray according to his will, we know we have what we ask for it, First John, because it's his will and we can receive it. Don't fall into the trap of seemingly intelligent people who say, this doesn't apply anymore, or this was just the old covenant, or, or um, that's not the way things are now. You know, Jesus didn't really mean that. Hey, the most simple explanation of scripture is the most plain, simple truth of how it's said. That is bottom line. When you see people who are in uneducated, illiterate, and grasp onto a scripture that changes their life, you see that this is not complex and hard to understand. You don't have to go to a seminary to understand God's spirit speaking to your heart and showing you something to do. Be careful. Get in this word yourself and fall before the Lord and cry out, Holy Spirit, show me what this means and what you want me to do. Revelation 22, 20, we're closing in, last verses. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly, which means suddenly, fast. When he arrives, it's going to start happening fast. That's why we're encouraged to be ready. Even so, come Lord Jesus, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all the saints, with you, Amen. This is the last. This is the last of the book. What does it mean, amen, here? I'm going to throw this last little thing in there. You know, a lot of people say, well, that means so be it or whatever. Well, it kind of, in a way, has that connotation. But it comes from a Hebrew word, aman, which means to be faithful. So when he's saying, ending the book with amen, it means be faithful to walk this out. The first time the word uh, Ammon, the Hebrew word that this comes from, appears in the Bible was when Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Abraham, Ammon, amen. He was faithful. He was trustworthy to walk out what God had showed him. And that is the, the admonition here at the end of the book. Walk it out. Amen. Walk it out. Now, in the New Testament, it took on the, the meaning of, of true or truly. And so Jesus would say, verily, verily, I say unto you. That is truly, truly. If you look it up in the Greek, the language he was speaking, the Aramaic, it says, amen, amen. This is important. Listen up and walk this out. So, uh, this is, these things are certain, and this is something that uh, is made for us to walk out, not just to talk about or think about. So be careful to keep the words of the prophecy of this book. There are tremendous rewards and tremendous advantage to following Jesus. Love Jesus, love people, and be obedient to what the Spirit shows you. When something comes alive in this book, it's because the Spirit is revealing it to you. It's not too late to do something for the kingdom of God. It's not too late to be discipled or to start making disciples. Uh, but the Bible does talk about a time when it will be too late. Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Heavenly Father, help us to take these words to heart and to be doers of your word, not hearers only. I ask you to bless your people, Lord. Make your face shine on them so they can reflect your goodness to those around them and to the nation. Lord, I just thank you, Father, for those who have uh, tuned in. I appreciate every single one of you. And, and I do pray that God will give you favor and grace as he holds you in his hands, as he looks upon you with joy and pleasure and as he allows you to walk in his shalom, his peace. God bless you guys.